I mean, it's unfair on our yeah. lads, wasn't it? Terrible. Fair, Drastic. I mean, oh, terrible, terrible. And that Eddie Emmins scoring four runs off the last ball against Essex, done me yeah. in, that did. Sacked a lot of them. But anyway, what have you been up to? Well, That's the key I've, to it. My, my soccer camps, as usual, you know, yeah. I've been doing that. But I was also involved, Jim, in the summer in FIFA's Under-16 World Cup tournament. Oh, yeah. And would you believe Scotland got to the final That's to right. play Saudi Arabia, having, Hamden Park. They're having their pre-vegetarian match meal there. Well, the Saudis were out an hour before the game, Jim. Obviously yeah. delighted to be at Hamden, you know, kissing yeah. the, the sacred turf. Yes, Big crowd, 52,000, Jimmy, for it. In fact, the, the tournament took off in Scotland with, with great gates right throughout. And our young team, you know, got going once the tournament got underway and play, started playing well and uh, got to the final on merit and did really well. And Downey, great cross the yeah. for Downey, rather, by Dick off the, uh, to put us in the lead. Good goal. Great Super, goal, we, wasn't we, it? To tell you, too, we play some lovely football. Actually, you're not playing like Scottish football at all. You're playing really well here, aren't you? <laughs> um, well, this this is uh, young Dickov who's signed by the Arsenal. Jim, how about that for a goal? That's great goal. Yeah, delightful. Yeah, goal lovely goal. Was impressed. He actually had a very, very good tournament. Yeah. Looks to be, you know, a great prospect. And as I say, it was marvellous for the fans. But having been two up, Jim, we did let it slip. This was Al Rashudi. Was it? Scoring from this yes, free kick. Yes, I know him well. But they, they were a powerful, strong side, weren't they, Salis? I mean, it well, is... The it, story was, Jim, that, that there were a lot of them were over age. Well, and, I mean, you look great. at them and, and right. they did look older. Yeah. And I think at the end of the day, the strength of yeah. the Saudis took its toll well, because, you know, they, they were much stronger in the second half than our fellas. And, uh, well, eight of them have got testimonials this year, <laughs> so... <laughs> but, so they, they levelled it at 2-2, but unfortunately, we missed a penalty kick. Yes. We missed a penalty kick in the 90 minutes, and then the whole tournament then went to penalties, a penalty yeah. shootout. And Brian O'Neill, the laddie that had missed the penalty in the 90 minutes, also, I'm sorry to say, missed his vital one, Jim, in the shootout, and, uh, and that cost us the tournament. Oh, that's a shame, and it's a shame for one so young to see the tough side of football, but that's what it's all about, unfortunately. But there you are. Well, in the uh, Saudis, as I say, very experienced side, and, yeah, and this to, is, they handled it much better than this us. This is Ian Rushdie, <laughs> who took the penalty Good. there, wasn't it? So, Not Saudis today. are the world champions, and delighted that they yeah. were. It was a very good tournament. Super. I mean, I, I know that everybody was enthusiastic about it, so it's super. Good. Well, the Barclays League season starts today with the news that the biggest club in the land has changed hands in a deal valued at £20 million. Martin Edwards, the Manchester United chairman, sold his 51% share of the club to Michael Knighton, an Isle of Man tax exile. Now, some United fans have been critical of the way that the club has been run in recent years. So how has the takeover been received? Martin Tyler is at Old Trafford right now. Well, we're, what, 80 minutes away from the start of a new season. Not a ball kicked yet, and here we are in the middle of a major football news story, and that's largely because of the man alongside me, the new owner of Manchester United, Michael Knighton. Michael, you've said, and all the fans have read it in the papers this morning, your aim is to make Manchester United the greatest club in the world. How do you set out trying to do that? Uh, Martin, absolutely. That is the fundamental prerequisite. That's what we must aim for. Uh, many would argue, and I think they're right, this already is the greatest football club in the world. People say the legend is tarnished. Uh, I don't think it is. It's going to be part of my job to restore the legend and foster it. But I think one thing that supporters have been concerned about has been the commercial side of the club seems to have taken priority over the playing side. Now, you come in from a business background, a self-made millionaire, how can you reassure the fans that your priorities are football? I can give everyone out there watching this programme today, and more especially the fantastic Manchester United fans, that my interest is soccer. I'm a soccer enthusiast. I started my working career as, uh, in the realms of professional soccer. Uh, this is a wonderful privilege for me. I'm in no doubt of the enormous responsibility that's been bestowed upon my shoulders. This is in very safe hands indeed, I promise you. Will you be giving money immediately to Alec Ferguson to strengthen the Manchester United squad? As you well know, Martin, I'm not here to speculate and, uh, and, and postulate about transfer movements. Uh, this club has always been in the market for class players and it will continue to be so. They were in the bottom half of the table for the first time for 15 years last season. That suggests there's a lot to be done. There's, there's a lot to be done. Obviously, it's a new season. Uh, tabula rasa, clean slate. We go out there now to prove that Manchester United can hold their own in this league. We'll be there or thereabouts. I'm absolutely confident. 
Welcome to the world of professional football, Michael, and good luck to you. Thanks very much for talking to us. Martin, thank you very much. Goodbye. Mm, well, very articulate for an ex-professional footballer, <laughs> isn't he? <it? laughs> I believe he played till he was 16. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Well, what do you think? Turn up for the books, isn't it? Hey, that one. I mean, how much of a difference Jim will it make to Manchester United? Well, since he's not playing, it's difficult to <laughs> judge at the moment. Uh, it's really about Jim, how much money if, he's going to be prepared to put and to buy players I to I suppose compete. it is. I mean, I, I don't know whether a chairman makes a football club or not. It'll be interesting to watch this development and, and see how it does go yeah. on. Right. It's, see see if he can back up uh, his early statements. Oh, absolutely. OK. Right, well, that story was just part of the jigsaw changes that have taken place since Arsenal took the title at Anfield back on May the 26th in that dramatic finale to the season. Here's Martin again to highlight the significant moves this summer. In the 12 weeks since Arsenal's amazing achievement at Anfield, their rivals have spent heavily to coordinate their challenge this time. For Neil Webb, it's now the red of Manchester United. As a new regime starts off the pitch at Old Trafford, Webb will be expected to stimulate success on it. This is his pre-season goal against Everton in Japan. Webb now in tandem with Michael Phelan, who was outstanding at the club he captained, Norwich City. United have sold players as well. Norman Whiteside left for Everton and quickly made his own point about the move by scoring against his old club in that Far East exhibition tour. Everton's investment has been particularly high-priced. Mike Newell, born in Liverpool, is now a million pound forward after learning his trade at Crewe, Wigan, Luton and Leicester. Defender Martin Keown has worked his way north to Everton from Arsenal and Aston Villa. The fee here is £750,000. And Everton have cast their eyes to Europe as well. This is Stefan Wren who will add to the competition for places at Goodison Park. Liverpool's one big purchase, another Swedish star, Glenn Hussein, a defender with an international pedigree. At Arsenal, it's Icelander Siggy Jonsson who's made the move from Sheffield Wednesday. Jonsson scoring here against Charlton last season. He's the only new acquisition at Highbury. Other imported players are much more familiar. Much of Tottenham's title hopes are pinned on Gary Lineker, readapting to the hurly-burly of the British game. He's already had a painful reminder. North Londoner Steve Sedgley should settle quickly after his £750,000 transfer from Coventry. A former Spurs striker is also back in the first division. Clive Allen, who sets high goal standards and therefore has kept his value. His fourth seven-figure switch has brought him from Bordeaux to Manchester City. Connection with France remains, though, with the loss to the English game of Chris Waddle. Waddle already well into the French league season with Marseille. Waddle's considerable repertoire is being revealed to a new audience. And Alan McAnally has quickly made his mark in Munich. The Scottish international struck these two goals in his first appearance in the Bundesliga against Nuremberg. Bought by Bayern for more than a million from Aston Villa. McAnally spearheading Bayern Munich's attempts to retain their West German championship. 11 of the last 14 football league titles have gone to the Northwest, where four clubs make their bids this time. The Midlands also have four contenders. The most remarkable feature of the geographical split is the unprecedented number of London clubs, eight in all. Chelsea have brought First Division football back to Stamford Bridge after just a one-year gap. Also in London, Crystal Palace, who owed their place back in the limelight to a pulsating climax in the playoffs. Three minutes left as McGoldrick turns it in! That's made it cheer now! At Highbury, the profits from their prize are being reinvested in the ground, even more sophistication at a club which has always been proud of its style. Eight London clubs will stage First Division fair, but there'll be none at Upton Park, where Lou Macari is installed in charge of the favourites for the Second Division Championship. A West Ham without John Lyle will take some getting used to. It's a London too without Vinnie Jones, who's left Wimbledon for Leeds United, but hasn't forgotten his past if he loses his cup winner's medal, Vinny now has his own memento. 
and cut memories have provoked a change at Coventry City. This season, they're reverting to a style of shirts very similar to those worn so proudly at Wembley in 1987. There's pride, too, at Maidstone United starting their full-time adventure. Good luck to the league's newest club. They'll play their home games at Dartford. Good luck, too, to the league's new president, Bill Fox, from Blackburn Rovers, whose term of office has begun in such turmoil. Football must recognise the need for the brand of leadership Gordon Taylor can provide, whatever his formal position in the administrative structure of the game. Other omens are very encouraging, particularly with Barclays extending their sponsorship of the league for an additional three seasons. Football will benefit by £7 million. The game's appeal remains magnetic. Michael Thomas showed that when he turned himself and football's form book upside down. The challenge for football now is to follow that. Well, some ending that was, but to the beginning of it again, back to Gordon Taylor, really, and, and, and the problems there that uh, him moving over to the Football League and the PFA stopping him in. I can't understand the reason why they've done that. You can't understand the players no, stopping him. No, I cannot understand the players stopping him. I mean, here they would have had a very sympathetic voice on the Football League, which they've never had in the yeah. past. And the game needs a man like him, who sees all sides of, uh, of the situation, yeah. to, to be with the Football League. Yeah, I think and it's in the players' interest, you're right enough for him, to be the chief executive. So, yeah. you know, maybe, maybe they're holding him back there. It, but to the football side, Jim, the, the big five are expected to, yeah. to be in there competing. Yeah. Do you see anybody outside of that this no, year doing it? No, I can't see it. Can you? Honestly, I mean, the, the Forest uh, uh, will be there or thereabouts, one or two, maybe Sheffield Wednesday, who knows. But at the end of the day, it's going to be one of the big five. And if they ever get in trouble, Ian, the checkbook will come yeah. out, they'll buy a couple yeah. of players, and yeah. away they go. Away they go, right. Well, uh, day one of the season wouldn't seem quite the same without a word from the man who can tell you what's good value at the bookies. So if you fancy a flutter, I recommend that you pay close attention to what John McCrinnick's got to oh, say no. at Sandown Park. John, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Saints. Well, down here, it's a betting ring. It's a steamy jungle, as you can imagine. And at the start of the footer season, there's a horse in the 3-5 on Channel 4, number 7, Take a Bath. Horse fancied each way, and you'll be able to collect your money after about 90 seconds of action. But it'll take nearly nine months of torment, hope and despair before you know your fate in the football leagues. Now, shopping around among the big three bookies, and always remember some of the independents will go bigger prizes, Liverpool are five to four favourites to win their 11th championship in the last 16 years. Arsenal are five to one to win again. Multi-million pound club Manchester United and Spurs, and they're not short of a few bob themselves. They're eight to one. And for the best each way, that's first, second or third, how about little Norwich, the Canaries who ruffled a few feathers last season at 50 to one. And the division's top scorer, well, Gary Lineker's 5-1 to one over Liverpool's Russian Aldridge with Alan Smith 7-1, to one, and at least double that bar the four. And there are lots of betting <coughs> opportunities. Those of you who want to flatter, the bookies want your money. And in Division 2, Leeds and West Ham dominate the betting. But David Pleats, Leicester City could be a big price at 20 to 1. Birmingham now in the third division, and that's unbelievable. And Notts County, their favourites. But that 20 to 1 Brentford is quite enticing. And the most open race is Division 4, with 10 to 1 Scunthorpe and South End. Though Grimsby could be a fair price at 12 to 1. And brave little Maidstone in their first Barclays League season are only 16 to 1 for the fourth division title. In Scotland, Rangers, beaten last week, are 5 to 4 on for the Premier Division with 15 to 8 Celtic and 6 is Aberdeen. And as for my beloved relegated Newcastle, I doubt whether the Geordies now could beat the England cricket team the way they're playing. They're 12 to 1 for Division 2. But Greavesy, there's a question in a quiz in the Supporters Club magazine, The Magpie, which asks, who plays at St James's Park? And the humiliating correct answer, the team in black and white. <laughs> Thanks very much, John. Thank you, John. I'm quite <coughs> right. It is the yeah. team in black so and white. So if you were having a, a quick flutter, where would your money go? I would never bet because I can't see any value there. I think Liverpool will win it comfortably, Ian. I don't uh -huh. think they'll I make do. any mistakes from the start this season. And I know you agree with me. Yes. 
So it's no point, we'll keep our money in my pocket. Really? Might as well. Might as well. Right, we'll take a break now. When we return, some amazing World Cup action and the thoughts of Rangers manager Graeme Souness on the future at Ibrox Park. Join us in a couple of minutes. Happiness is a cigar called Hamlet, the mild cigar. This is the Mirov II, a revolutionary sports turbo from the Soviet Union. Ten years from now, you might just see commercials like this. It's the sort of investment opportunity we look into at Norwich Union. If you're in the know, you're in the Norwich. The Norwich Union. alcohol, 100% tenants. Once upon a time, a long, long time ago, wherever you'd lead me, I would surely follow. Girl, you put me through some pain and misery, and now you are standing on my doorstep telling me how much you need me baby ain't nobody home back. And of all the remarkable events of the summer, perhaps the most far-reaching, was the signing of Mo Johnson for Glasgow Rangers. And manager Graeme Souness has indicated that once and for all he's prepared to break all the unwritten rules to achieve greater success at Ibrox. This week I've been to chat with him. Mo Johnson's arrival signalled the end of a hundred years of bigotry at Ibrox. No longer would a player's religion be the criteria to become a Rangers player. A stipulation Graham Souness laid down on his arrival at Ibrox. No, I, I've, I've been asked the question, I was asked the question, if I would sign a Catholic for Rangers. Um, I'd said I would do if the right one became available. And when Morris did become available, I felt I had to go for him. I think in footballing terms, he, um, he is right for this club because he's a quality player. We were in need of a top-class striker. I would have been a fool not to go for him. On the religious side, really, I was brought here to manage a football club. It's never been part of my life, never will be. He was judged solely on his football ability, and that's why I bought him. Has it been a, a conscious change of policy by the board here at Ibrox to allow you to do that? It was a board decision which um, which enabled me to go out and buy them. Yes, we talked about it. We obviously knew what it meant. And um, they felt if we were to go forward, and there will be big changes in football in, in the coming years, if we were to go forward, um, we had to break this barrier. Rangers' other big money signing was less controversial. Trevor Stephen left Everton to join his England colleagues at Ibrooks, 
and was an immediate hit with this winner against Spurs in a pre-season show game. So, immediate success for Stephen. But on the debit side, Chris Woods dislocated his shoulder in the opening league match against St Mirren, which meant the chequebook was out again, engaging the services of Israeli goalkeeper Bonnie Ginsberg. But do Rangers have the buying power of the top European clubs? I think um, we have to be realistic. Forget the religious thing. We have to be realistic. We can never, come, we can never, we at Rangers and Alec Ferguson at Manchester and Kenny at Liverpool, George Graham Arsenal, we can never compete with, with Milan or Juventus or Real Madrid, Barcelona. We could never hope to compete with them in financial terms. Now, Graham, I'll put you on the spot. If you had one ambition for Rangers this year, what would it be? Um, win a league match. <laughs> well, one one yet. The Rangers boss, however, will have to watch his side from the comfort of the director's box, courtesy of a 12-month touchline ban by the SFA. But he feels a fairer system should be in operation. Not to try and tell anyone how to do their jobs, but um, I would think it'd be fair if we, if a system was adopted where it was the same as a player. If a player, first offence, he got so many points, second offence, more points when he reached a certain amount. You got a three game or a four game. In the light of the Hillsborough inquiry, uh, the accent is now on comfort for the fans, all seat in the stadium, and Rangers really are ahead of the game there. It was a necessity. There was a terrible disaster here, and a lot of people lost their lives, and the board of directors at the time felt they had to change the stadium. Um, we now, I feel, have the best stadium in Britain for football, and maybe one of the best in Europe. And our stadium is a very comfortable stadium. Easy access. Um, you're watching the game in, com in comfort. Again, we're now competing with, you know, people can go to the video shop and buy a video, staying and watching the comfort of the house when it's maybe snowing outside or raining outside. I think the days of, of people actually wanting to go and stand on a terrace and get soaking wet and enjoy football, I don't think that's the way forward. I think those days have gone. Do you not think it's time that international matches were played here, Graham? Yeah, again, I think people have to look closely at that situation. Um, can a government with a clear conscience spend millions on a stadium that's going to be used half a dozen times, a dozen times a year for different things when there is hospitals to be built, when there is new roads to be built, when there is new schools to be built? It is a lovely and romantic thought to have a national stadium. But if the economics don't stack up, it's an ongoer. Two championships in three years is not a bad record, but Graham would like to emulate the success of his old club, Liverpool. I'm sure I have my critics, I know I have my critics, but if I can ever achieve, you know, what Liverpool have done, then um, I'll be a successful manager. I think there's a lot of managers who have tried to achieve that and never got anywhere near it. And only Tim will tell if I ever get anywhere near that. Well, a very honest assessment here uh, from Graham Souness. Uh, on the Mo Johnson thing, I think he was quite right, Jim. I think he had to break the mould and, and he's been brave enough to do it. And I think it'll be for the benefit of Rangers Football Club. You know, there'll be a much stronger team for it. Uh, do you think they'll win the league? I have to put you on the spot here. We're talking about mm. bets before. Well, they should do, Ian. I mean, they, they lost last week. As I say, the only break he's had so far are his ribs. But, um, <laughs> uh, you know, they should do. They've got a good enough side. And again, the chequebook counts, doesn't it? They can buy somebody yeah. in the middle if they want to. That's I don't think you can see past them this year. No, not really. Well, one of the, the main themes of this new season will be the World Cup qualifying competition culminating in the finals in Italy beginning on June the 8th next year. The South Americans have just started their group matches and already Brazil have been involved in some amazing scenes. They beat Venezuela 4-0 in Caracas and then met Chile in Santiago last week. It was some occasion, as Peter Brackley reports. A night of controversy and bizarre events begins to smoulder even before the match starts. Romario, the Brazilian, involved in a none too friendly exchange of views prior to the kickoff. With so much to play for, both teams having beaten Venezuela in their opening games, the highly charged atmosphere boils over after only two minutes. A dreadful foul by Chile's Ormeno, leaving Brazilian defender Branco writhing in agony. But while referee Jesus Diaz from Colombia issues a yellow card for Romano, Romario decides on a spot of instant revenge, choosing Isis here as his victim. Romario, whose dazzling skill has been such a feature of Brazil's recent resurgence, now suffers the humiliation of being sent off.
Referee Diaz clearly fears a riot and calls for police assistance in his efforts to keep order. Peace is restored, but only briefly. Olmedo commits a second bookable offence, less great than perhaps than the first, but spotted by the linesman, and Chile are now also down to ten men. Not that Olmedo seems too keen to go. Eight bookings in all in this volatile affair, and drama too surrounds the goals. Brazil's opener early in the second half, a bizarre own goal from Chile's Gonzalez, hit by Ostongo's clearance. But watch here now for an extraordinary equaliser. Only a few minutes left, Brazil goalkeeper Tafarel is penalised. The Chileans wrestle the ball from him. And from the indirect free kick, Ivo Basso scores amid chaotic scenes. This preserving Chile's hopes of squeezing out Brazil for a place in Italy next year. What an incredible game. Um, but did you understand what actually was happening there with that equaliser? Oh, the, the goal was incredible. The goalkeeper, what a dummy. That's the, <laughs> that's the Chilean have it. The Chilean, quite rightly, takes a quick free kick. His mate's on. There he is. A perfectly good goal, really, Ian, because the Brazilians can't go back ten yards yeah. because, uh, the, you know, they're only two yards off their goal line. Super thinking from so. the Chileans. But, I mean, it's going to be rough over there, isn't it, I would think, trying to get to the World Cup final. <laughs> oh, dear, oh, dear, not many. Yeah, but England's next game sees them up against the Sweden and Stockholm in a match that's vital to their World Cup future. Sweden were in action at home this week without, I must say, a great deal of success. For the watching Bobby Robson, this was to prove a most encouraging night. Sweden eventually outplayed by a French team that hadn't won a single match in almost a year and a half. Not that the game suggests an upset early on. Sweden taking the lead after only four minutes. A stunning strike from Benfica's new signing, Jonas Tern. But throughout the game, the Swedish defence looks far from stable. Even with Liverpool's Hussein to marshal them. And on 49 minutes, Ravelli fumbles a Perez cross and Cantona, back in favour after a recent ban, equalises for France, their first goal in six internationals. Five minutes later, France go ahead, the scorer Papin, Chris Waddle's new teammate at Marseille. Again, the Swedish defence are struggling. But then a lapse of concentration at the other end enables Sweden to draw level. All rather untidy at the finish, a simple tap-in from substitute Lundqvist. Deservedly, though, this turns out to be France's night. Their lead restored by Papin, courtesy again of a deflection. Papin, last season's leading goal scorer in the French League, and he promises a fruitful partnership with Chris Waddle. For the Swedes, this is an unsettling time. Remember, they were thrashed 6-0 by Denmark earlier in the summer. And their misery in Malmo this week, completed by Cantona, as France at last win a match under Michel Platini. So France uh, beginning to look good, Jims, but I must say that the Swedes, two defeats in a row, I mean, it's got to augur well for Bobby Robson. The Swedes do not look very good. <laughs> On the 6th of September, England will go there and we will win. It's as simple as that. Well, you're so confident. I am so confident. More confident than this set not falling <laughs> down. They gave us a new bit of tape, look, look to keep it going. Well, so it's most not too bad at all, is it? But it... It's, can't <laughs> knock it down now because it's a listed building, actually. It's got... We're going to have a blue plaque next week. Brian Moore slept here, 1932. <laughs> OK, right, that is it. Now, a chance, uh, Jim, so... Uh, to, I've lost where I was going there because you're making me laugh. Oh, I don't mind. I well, mean, it's only 50 tonight you can see local football in your regions in London, Anglia and Granada. And of oh, course, do don't it. forget, 4.45, the results with Elton Wellsby. We shall see you next week. Bye-bye for now. New time. If the Back to our old time. time. Yes. yes. Thirty-four go.